treasures that fade are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love through the book of Acts, but on Christmas and New Year's, we just kind of wanted to take a break from that flow and just do a kind of a uh, messages to fit the holiday season that we're in right now. So my message here this morning is a new creation in a new year, or a better title would be a new you in a new year. Does that sound good? How many people have ever thought back and like, oh, if I could just go back and uh, if I could just do this different, or if I could have just done this, or... Um, I remember when I was in college, not in college, I was in San Antonio, me and a buddy were doing investing, and I was investing in this one stock for a dollar and fifty cents. And it went to a dollar forty, and that was too much. So I sold it all. And then I looked like a year or two ago, and it was like eighty-two dollars a share. And I had like five hundred dollars in at a dollar forty, and I was like, why? If I only if I would have just kept that, if I just would have done this different. So as we approach the new year, sometimes 
easy to look back and look at all the things we wish we would have done or uh, how we would have changed things or what life is, it would have been like if only this or that. And sometimes we're like, if I could just have a do-over, if I could just pause and reset, if I could just do that. And we've all kind of thought that. But I kind of want to take this message and on the new year, it's a perfect time to talk about the new creation we have in Christ. We can't redo the things that have been done. However, there is hope for renewal, restoration, and fresh starts, new beginnings in Christ alone. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'll be our, my own reader here this morning, and I'm going to start in the book of Psalms, Psalm 51. And we'll do the first 11 verses. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Against you, you only have I sinned. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have Broken rejoice, hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Moving to the New Testament, I'm actually going to do the Ephesians passage first, and then we'll conclude with 2 Corinthians 5. I love the book of Ephesians. It just has such a flow from life without God all the way to life in Christ and spiritual warfare and the armor of God. But we're going to pick up in chapter 4, and that talks about the new life we have in Christ. Verse 17 through 24. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous, and they have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Finally, we'll finish a familiar passage here in 2 Corinthians And we'll just read 16 through 19. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet, now we know him, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself, through Jesus Christ and have given us in the ministry of rec- have given us the ministry of reconciliation that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses against them and has committed us to the world committed to us the word of reconciliation all right, that's a pretty cool passage. If you really study um, out the original language, some of these words are added. We all know the phrase, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So the he is there has been added by the translators to make it make sense in English. If you, if you transcribe it literally, it says, if anyone is in Christ, 
It's almost like, boom, new creation. If anyone is in Christ, not you become or you develop, it's if you are in Christ, new creation. And I would put a boom, exclamation point, exaggeration, and emphasis on that point. It's you're, you're in one of two possibilities. So uh, as, as we come to the new year, I want to talk about this concept of spiritual rebirth, of new life, of new man versus the old man. I'm going to use some of these phrases interchangeably, but the concept is when, and I'm going to try to explain it, a spiritual concept in as simple of terms as I can, Um, There's no children's church today, so I hope everybody can understand what I'm trying to say. And if I do my job well, I think we will. So, um, but I want to I want to talk about the reality of a new life there is in Christ. So it says, how how can you experience a new creation? You must be in Christ. Now we have we have two two options. You can be in the box in Christ or out of the box, not in Christ. And unlike the cat that can be both in the box and out of the box at the same time with two feet in and two feet out, we don't really get that option. The Bible doesn't really deal with gray areas. It's either good or it's evil. You're either alive or you're dead. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You're going toward God or you're going away from God. There's no gray area of pretty good, or mostly alive, or somewhat dead, or it, it's black and white. The, the gospel is simple. It's easy. It's, it's clear. And there has to be this process of being in Christ. Now, sometimes we as humans like to try to manufacture an experience, or a spiritual right, or a process or some sort of ceremony to try to equate to this being in Christ. Some people, the Catholics, like to go through confirmation. We like to have baptism. We like to have a declaration of faith. All good things. I'm not discrediting them. However, there is no substitute for Christ Jesus. There's no substitute for a Christian being in Christ. The fact that you're in church here this morning doesn't necessarily put you in the box that you are in Christ and have experienced regeneration, a new life with him. The Bible says in Matthew, a terrifying passage where it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will be saved. And they'll say, no, we cast out demons in your name. We, we've served you our whole life. I was watching this, um, this video of this minister. He, he was like in his 80s and he had been a minister his whole life and he he had some sort of near-death experience, and he, he saw God, and God said, um, you know, he, and, and it, was, it was basically everything he did was meaningless. And he was, he was arguing with God and said, no, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister. Everything I've done has been for you. And he said, God, God said, everything you did was a sacrifice to a false idol, to a false god. And he said, how can that be? He said, you, everything you did was for self. You did nothing for me. You called me Lord, but you never made me Lord of your life. And that, that's a humbling concept to deal with. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you experienced an encounter with the resurrected Christ. Now, we just got done with Christmas. We like little baby Jesus in the manger. And little baby Jesus is sweet. He doesn't, can't even say anything. He can't convict you of sin. He's just cute. He's adorable. He's this precious gift to the world. He's hope. He's life. It's great. However, what we need to encounter is the resurrected Christ, the same resurrected Christ that met the disciples as they were praying in the upper room, who breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, the same resurrected Christ that uh, manifested to Paul on the road to Damascus and permanently changed the course of his life and transformed that life. So there's this experiential um, thing that we can have with Christ 
the resurrected Christ who's alive and well today. And you have to be in Christ to experience this new life. So as we're looking to this new year, I want you to be thinking, how do I want, it's good to look back, but how do I want this next year to look? How do I want to do this next year differently? How can I live this life in Christ have my relationship deepen with Christ? How can, I, how can I set myself up to be in Christ's will, to be this new creation, to demonstrate creation as it was intended to be from the beginning? So as we're talking about new creation and new life, I want to first take a look at our old, not old, but rather the first creation account. Now, first of all, God is the only one that can create Anything. We're, we're good at, as humans to manipulate, to rework, to rebuild, to take the matter that God already created. If we can turn it into a house, we can turn it into a gold mine, we can turn it into a car. We can rework the stuff that's been created, but we can't create anything. Science will say, oh, we created life. No, you just took a sperm and an egg that's already created and mixed them together and you watched, you altered the the normal process of of life and rebirth. You can manipulate, you can corrupt, you can twist, you can you can change things, but you cannot create. So there has to be this, if we want to experience this new creation, there has to be creation. The best physical example is the creation account in Genesis. We see Genesis chapter one. It says why we are created in the first place. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and everything that creeps on the face of the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created them. Did you ever sit down to, to wonder God has called us to be fruitful and multiply and to act ourselves as an accurate representation of God and earth. And we are called to be fruitful and multiply and create more people that reflect Christ. Now you take a look at the world and you say, there's a whole lot of people reflecting something other than Christ. If you have kids, you'll say, my child is not currently reflecting a heavenly, holy, righteous God that's abundant in truth. And uh, there, there's, something else is bleeding through here. There's a little bit of rebellious, fleshly, demonic, something coming through this kid. What is, what is going on here? Well, the reality is there's, we've been created. If we go back to the original creation, we've been created body soul, and spirit. We see Genesis 2-7 say, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So we have God coming down to earth, fashioning out of the clay, out of the dirt, out of the mud, a man. Then he breathes a heavenly spirit of breath into this man, who is now part earthly and part spiritual, and at that moment, soul is created. Now, soul has the mind and will and emotion. So, as soon as you are created and you're born into this earth, you have a soul, which means you have a will, which means you can control your destiny to a certain point. You can choose how you will live your life. It's not predetermined for you. However, as you can probably say from experience, have you ever struggled with sin? Have you ever struggled with temptation? Have you ever felt this inner pull that one thing is pulling you one way and one thing is pulling you another, where you have a desire in you to be spiritual and holy and good, and you have another nature that's pulling you to um, fulfill the appetites of the flesh, lust, gluttony, um, whatever it may be, lies, uh, deception, pride, um, greed, whatever it may be. You have this inner war that goes on between yourself. How can this be? It's because we are created in this earth with a spiritual divine nature and with an earthly nature. We are part earth. We are part flesh. We are partly clay. However, God breathed a spirit of life within us. And at that moment, we become a living soul. 
Now, the philosopher Plato described it this way. He has the analogy of a chariot being attached to a white horse and to a black horse. He called the white horse spirited, the black horse appetitive, which basically means you have this, you are the chariot driver, you have one horse, and these horses are winged for some reason, one horse that's trying to fly continually upward into heaven and to exercise the spiritual nature within man himself, and you have another horse that's trying to pull you down to the depths of hell to respond to every carnal desire, fleshly appetite that you can imagine that's trying to pull you that way. Now, when God created man, did he create you perfect? He said, everything is good. Everything is right. Everything is the way it ought to be. Did God, was something wrong with God's original design? No. But then what happened? Sin happened, right? So we have, you know, once again, it's actually a really great analogy, even better than our modern psychology of your ego and your id and your super ego, this, this great uh, picture of a chariot driver who, you have the reins, right? You have one horse going this way, one horse going this way, and you can, you can struggle against this, and you can determine which way that's going to go. You have, a, you have a pull in both directions. Now, what happens when sin comes in, when, when God said, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die, and Adam and Eve fall into temptation, they sin, they eat the fruit, did they drop dead physically? No. Was God a liar? When you eat the fruit, you shall die? No. Then what death did they experience? They experienced an immediate spiritual death, and that disconnection from the spirit will lead to eventual mortal death. So, in effect, you, you cut the reins to the spiritual horse, and now it's just you fighting against this fleshly horse, trying to pull you down to the depths of hell. And even if you want to, the best you can maintain is maybe a straight line, trying to fight against this horse, trying to pull you away. And you've cut off all power and life to this spiritual horse, or this, this drive to bring you to ascent, righteousness, good, truth, because you have been put to death spiritually. Now, it's God's design from the beginning that you would be spirit. He breathed into you the spirit of God. So the only way to restore this broken creation that's now corrupted through sin is by a new creation. The Bible says it has never existed before. When you are a new creation, it's not a rebuild, it's not a rework, it's something completely new. So God's desire from the beginning is to create a creation that bears the image of God, reflects spiritual truth, operates in righteousness in truth, and is heading, according to the Bible, operating in truth and doing what's right. And at the same time, we, even now, experience this pull to the flesh. So how do we wrestle with these? And what is this new birth? What is this new life, this regeneration, being saved, being unsaved, all about and how, how do we how do we wrestle with where we are today? Well, that's really the question I want you to ponder as we as we do this New Year's message. I know it's New Year's Eve, but as we look into the next year of 2024, we have to realize the situation that we are in. We as humans have this pull. We have a sin nature. We we sin. Is there any sinless, perfect people in this life? Raise your hand if you've. <laughs> Uh, no, nobody's done it. No, everyone has failed. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. There's an inner rebellious nature within us where we all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? We're all in that same camp. So, how can we experience this new creation? How can we be in Christ and experience this new creation? How do we live the life? How do we fulfill God's original design for us to be fruitful, to, be, to multiply, to fill the earth with imagers of God that are representatives, that are righteous, that are holy, that do what God intended them to do from the beginning. You cannot do it through religion, through education, through effort, through self-will, through any sort of religious practice. You have to experience 
Christ. You have to experience a regeneration with Christ. Now, I'm not saying you go face-to-face with baby Jesus in the manger or face-to-face with the Nazarene Jesus, the prophet, the the minister feeding the 5,000, or even necessarily the resurrected Christ. However, you have to realize the resurrected Christ is alive and well today, and his desire for your life is is the same thing it's always been, is to be a perfect, righteous example, a human on this earth that has cut off the reins to this horse pulling us to sin, in living a righteous life according to truth. Now, here's the good news. All the effort, all the work, all the the avenue to receive this new life, to cut off the old man, to cut off the desire for sin, to quit following this appetite that pulls you away from God and kills us spiritually and disconnects us from Heavenly Father, that work has already been done. Now, Satan has one more card to play. He doesn't even have a card. He, he, he calls it a bluff, and Satan's a master bluffer. All he can do is lie. All he can do is deceive. If he can convince you that the work wasn't from you, if he can convince you that you are not who God created you to be, if he can convince you that you are a sinner and that you sin, that you can sin, then he wins. If you really, if you really think about Think about any sin you've ever committed in your entire life. The reality is, if you trace that to the root, at some point you've believed a lie in order to engage in that sin. If you saw the truth of the matter, if you saw things as it was, if you saw the consequence, the relationship effect it would have on Heavenly Father, if you saw the the ramifications for eternity that that sin would make in your life, you would never be even tempted with the thought of sin. However, at some point, you've believed a lie. I have no choice. Everybody does it. Everyone engages. I'm just a natural person. I'm a carnal being. I'm an earthly, fleshly thing. Of course I'm going to sin. Of course I have an appetite to sin. All I can do is feed this appetite for sin. I have no choice. I have no option. All I can do is feed my appetite for sin. Everybody does it. But the reality is, something has to happen in us to experience this life anew in Christ Jesus. We have this, this, this work that's going, that's kind of pulling us back and forth. Call it the horse, call it the... Uh, one time, we, I heard a chapel message by Dan Slater. I'll never forget it. He talked about two dog houses and two dogs and... If you, you, it's kind of one black, one white, one's good, one's evil, whichever one you feed will become stronger. And he also pictured them as almost like a tug of war match. If you feed your righteous self, if you feed yourself spiritually, you'll have the strength to overcome sin, death, temptation, and everything that it leads to. If you are not feeding yourself spiritually, if you cut off your spiritual man and you die spiritually, you neglect the Heavenly Father and your relationship with Him. What's going to take control in your life? The flesh, your appetite for sin, your desires for sin. So we have this picture of a corrupt, weak, soulish, mortal, uh, fallen, old, sinful man that we all have to wrestle with. It actually says in the Bible, if you are a sinner, you are subject to who? Satan. If you, let's, read, uh, let's read Ephesians one more time. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's see if I got it right. Oh, sorry. Ephesians chapter 2. Backing up a little bit. Verse 1 and 2 says this. And, ye, and you he made alive who were dead in their trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to this world, according to the prince and power, prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. You know who that's talking about? Satan. So you're either, you'll either follow your father, the father of sin, the father of lies, you'll believe deception, you'll fall into 
under, uh, false understanding of who you are and who you were made to be and fall into your sin nature, or in Christ you will have a revelation of who God has called you to be and you'll follow after your heavenly Father. What did Jesus say? I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I see my heavenly Father say. So Jesus is our perfect example of someone who has put to death this sin nature, this sinful old man. So on the, on the new man side, we have this new man who's been made perfectly new, which means when Christ comes in and does a work, when you are in Christ, which the Bible say, when you are in Christ, boom, new creation. Not that you were always perfect or that you were made perfect from the beginning or didn't have a sin nature to begin with. You did. But if you are in Christ, if you accept what Christ has done for you on the cross, if you accept the work that's already been done, then Christ disconnects. There's part, there's part of it. We, it disconnects our flesh and it makes room for a new life in the Spirit. So we then have the power to overcome sin and temptation. We have this new spiritual life. We now have an immortal, I think I spelled that wrong, uh, heavenly body. Sub, and we are now subject to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, no longer a slave to sin, no longer a slave to Satan. So it comes to death and life. There is only one end for our sinful bodies. What does the Bible say to do with our old man, our sinful nature? Crucify it, execute it, put it to death. The Bible believes in the death penalty. What do you do with a murderer, a liar? What do you do with adultery? What, do you, what was the Old Testament commandments for these sins? Something has to die to pay for that sin. There has to be a death penalty. We see in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 5, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his, Jesus's, death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you, just like Christ, reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. So, there has to be a death, and there has to be a life. So, um, sometimes we just read the Bible and say, oh yes, all Christians have put to death that sin nature and have overcome the desire to sin. But guess what? You're going to wake up tomorrow and guess what's still there? The flesh, your appetite, your lust, your desire for sin. James says your, your sin comes from lust and your lust and your imaginations what you think about will eventually become reality. Your lust will be conceived and those con will give birth to sin and sin will cause death. So the consequence of sin is death. We know from Romans, the wages of sin is death. But we also have this ability to have new life. Now, I want to ask you a question. We have this picture of the three crosses here. We know there's the cross, the center one in which Jesus was crucified. And we have the two other um, thieves that were put to death with him. There's kind of a, an unsung character here that we often forget at the crucifixion. Who was that center cross designed for? When that cross was put together, 
by the Romans, who were they making it for? Barabbas. Barabbas. Who is Barabbas? Everyone say, that's me. The sinner, the murderer, the liar that deserves to be crucified on that cross got to get off scot-free because somebody came in and take his place. Now, I'd love to imagine at this affair of the crucifixion that Barabbas himself went to that crucifixion, looked up on that cross, and said, that should be me up there. I deserve that. This man did not deserve to die on my behalf. That should have been me. I did the murdering. I did the thieving. I did all the sin to require this excruciating pain and death that this innocent man is doing on my behalf. So when that cross was created, it wasn't created for a sinless, righteous son of God, as are all of us in the new life and new birth through him. It was created for a sinner. It was created for someone worthy of the death penalty. And that picture of Barabbas getting off scot-free from the consequence of all his sin, and you know the, the choice should have been clear where Pilate puts up Barabbas or Jesus. Do you want a sinless, innocent, righteous miracle worker? Or do you want a pillaging, plundering, thieving, lying murderer to receive the death penalty? Now, any of us with any sort of logic not tainted by sin would be clearly the righteous man should go free and the murderer should be put to death. But there's this picture where we all, in the story of the crucifixion, we're Barabbas. If we believe Christ died in our place, if he died for my sin and your sin, you know what that makes you? That makes you Barabbas in the story. That makes you the one guilty of sin. And the good news is, if if you're Barabbas and he can get off scot-free then there's hope for you, there's hope for me, there's hope for the lost family member that you're believing God for, there's hope for each and every one of us in this life because the work has already been done. And Christ already died. He already took the place for you, for me, for every murderer, every liar, every sinner out there. He already paid the price so that we may live Now, this new life has to come from an encounter with the resurrected Christ. If we take a look at John chapter 20. So Jesus died. He uh, was buried for three days. He was resurrected again. Now, what happened when Jesus was resurrected? Now the baby that was born in the manger, now the prophet that was doing miracles, now this righteous son of God that never sinned or told a lie in his life was crucified, shed his blood innocently on our behalf. He was raised again after three days to hold the power of sin and death. Now he holds the keys to hell. Now he is the one that has been victorious over sin. He is the one chariot driver who always went to the correct way, who always led the spirited horse, who always fought against the pulling of the flesh and never executed or never uh, engaged in sin. He was the only one to do that, and he died an innocent life. He has victory over sin and death. This victorious, resurrected Christ comes to the disciples who are praying in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit. And just like at the original creation, just like in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, he leans down. God is always coming down to our level. He's stooping to create, and he's coming down to the disciples, and he breathes on them the breath of life once again. And what happens to them? Boom, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what David recognized in the Old Testament. David is a man way ahead of his time. He understood New Testament concepts in an Old Testament world. He said, God, create in me a new heart. Create in me a new spirit. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Do something with this sin nature inside me. I need to put it to death, but I keep sinning. I keep falling short. I have lusts. I have desires. I have an appetite for sin. And occasionally I do sin, but I don't want to break off fellowship with you. Help me with this sin nature. Put a new heart within me. Put a new desire within me. Do a transformative work within me. What he didn't realize was that we needed the encounter with Christ 
Jesus, this resurrected, victorious Lord. And I believe David, David got it. He got it. God recognized David's heart. His desire for that was spot on, and that's what we all should have is a desire to reconcile ourselves before God, to put away the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, to put away this sin nature that's always there pulling against and saying, no, I'm going to crucify that. I'll execute that. I'm going to let that nature be put to death on the death penalty that Jesus did for me. That's been put to death on my behalf. This resurrected Christ is the same one that met Saul, on the road to Damascus. And he's the same one that can transform your life and mine and everyone that you know. The, the family member that you're believing for, the friend at work that you're believing for, he can make a difference. This is the message of the gospel, is that new life, rebirth can be done through Christ Jesus for all that are in him. Now, the question you should be asking, how do you receive this new life? What, what, what can I do to be saved? What can I do to uh, start the process of transformation because I still sin, I still struggle with this, this pull, this bend, this appetite for the carnal, for the flesh. I'm still made of dirt. I still have dirt in me trying to be dirty. But I want to be clean. How do I renounce that once and for all? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, you, know, you don't even have to turn, it's right there for you. Colossians 3, 8 and 9 says, Now you yourselves are put off all of these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man and his deeds. The Bible says, All who lie follow their father, Satan, who is the father of lies, because the truth is not in him. Remember that? And have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Remember why God created you in the first place. He created you as an image of righteousness and truth. As a reflection of God on earth. As an ambassador for the heavenly kingdom here on this earth. Not to be a reflection of sin. Not to look like a picture of Satan in flesh. You're supposed to look like God in flesh. Now we don't always do that. But this is produced by a creative act of God. This is very important. Nothing on this earth will replace being in Christ Jesus. I don't care what denomination of church you go to. I don't care what accolades you've achieved in your life. I don't care how many times you've been dipped in water and baptized. I don't care how many times you've been confirmed. I don't care what college degrees you have. I don't care what sinner's prayer you've said. The only way to produce a new life in Christ. You yourselves cannot create anything new. It's like mankind always tries to create a facade, an edifice, something that resembles the spirit, but they can't quite do it. All that religion is good for is to slow the effects of sin or mask the effects of sin. It cannot cause rebirth or regeneration. One time I spoke a message and I called it the speckled banana. And it was a picture of, you know, your your bananas get worse and worse and they start with a few speckles and pretty soon, a few days later, they're they're black and they're only good for banana bread. What what can you do if you you know you're going to need that banana in like a week? You put it in the fridge, right? In, In some ways, that's all religion does. That's all the church does without Christ. You can slow decay. You can mask it. Do you know how old the apples are that you eat in the store? Those can be a year to two years old. Those beautiful, red, delicious, wax-covered apples that you see, they keep them in cold vacuum storage for months and months, and they can delay the effects of corruption. Mankind's great at coming up with great ideas to do it, but we cannot do a creative work. We can make it look like it'll last forever. We can prolong, we can can paint a nice red shiny coat on the top of it, and we can make it look like it's incorruptible, but it's not unless Christ does a creative work. Okay, off topic. Have you heard of the the new appeal, A-P-E-E-L? 
Bill Gates funded appeal to, uh, it's a new fruit and vegetable coating that'll give fruits and vegetables a much longer shelf life and it's gonna solve world hunger. I'm sure it'll be just as effective as all other Bill Gates backed health measures. And if you're worried, don't worry, the FDA says it's safe and it's fine and approved. <laughs> It's all organic product. It'll save the world as we know it. It's, ca it's literally called appeal. Anyway, so it's, it's, it's a perfect picture of the effects of man, of what, of what man does through religion. We'll do all we can. We'll go to great lengths to prolong, to delay, to mask the effects of sin. But guess what? You can't fix a rotten apple. Once it's rotten, you can paint it, you can freeze it, you can vacuum seal it, you can make it last as long as you want, you can slap a new coat of paint on it, but it's not going to fix the corruption from the inside out. Only regeneration, only new birth, only being in Christ will do that for you, for me, and for anyone else. Doesn't matter what Sunday school you went to, doesn't matter what church you go to, doesn't matter who your mom and dad are, only in Christ can you receive this new creation. And this new creation is actually a restoration of God's original design from the beginning. You all agreed that the design God did at creation was good, was perfect. We are supposed to have divine connectedness with God. We're supposed to have our flesh in check and in control. We're supposed to be a picture of God as an ambassador here on this earth, living a righteous and pure life. This experience is only based on truth the truth of God's word that brings true righteousness and holiness, not by your doing, but by the work that Christ already did on the cross. And Colossians also implicates this is an ongoing process. As much as you need to have a personal experience, an encounter with the Heavenly Father, with the resurrected Christ Jesus, not just an understanding of right and wrong, not just a feeling sorry for your sin, but a transformative encounter with Christ. To say, you were this way, and now you're that way. You're headed to Damascus to kill Christians, now you're headed there to evangelize the world. You're, you're there gathered in a group to pray, and now you're out fulfilling the Great Commission and doing what God has breathed into you through the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mandate to be his ambassadors here on earth. And this is an ongoing process. As much as it starts with an experience, you're not perfected there. The next day you're going to wake up and guess what? Your tummy is going to grow. Your flesh is going to flesh out. Your appetite for sin and temptation will still be there. However, you are placed squarely behind the reins of the chariot and you can say, no, I'm not going to follow this path. And yes, I'm going to reconnect this spirit to my heavenly Father, create a new heart in me. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Let me follow what your design was for me from the beginning. And let me stop falling into this pit of temptation and always just letting this horse lead me astray. Whatever you feed will grow. When you feed yourself spiritually, you empower yourself to overcome temptation to sin. Once your mind is enlightened to truth, you no longer see temptation as a legitimate option. You say, I know where this goes. I know who's tempting me. I know what the devil wants me to do. I no longer see the appeal of sin, pun intended. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you as we close out this year of 2023 that uh, as much as it was true from the beginning, it's still true today. The truth of your word reveals truth. Lord, we just pray for an inspiration and revelation and understanding of your truth, of who you intended us to be from the beginning. Help us to fulfill your mandate. Help us to be restored imagers of Christ. Help us to look to you, Christ Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior of each and every one of us, to restore in us connectedness to God, to cut off and put to death this desire of the flesh that's always pulling us astray, to have our eyes open to temptation and to sin and to, to the effects of sin and where that leads, to see what is at the end of that path, 
and to choose you each and every morning. And in this next year, say this next year is going to be a new life in you where we'll continue the ongoing process of renewal, of spiritual transformation, of living things according to the truth righteousness and holiness that you designed us to be from the beginning and say no longer am I that man that sin no longer am I that woman that falls into temptation but I am reborn a child of Christ and co-heir with him and I know what my destination is and I know what my purpose is here in this life in your name we pray amen the Lord bless you The Lord causes face to shine upon you and be gracious to you.